or other meanings of the word bark than just what came out of a dog. So uh, that line always threw me off a little bit. On my bark, so small and frail. I thought, that's a shame. I need to have a more boisterous bark, I guess. Uh, but I did eventually find out what it means. And if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. You go look it up. I'm going to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 9 with me, if you would please. Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, verse 1, if you would please follow along here as we read a little bit. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Now, I believe with every fiber of my being that Jesus Christ is over all. I really do. But I believe also what Paul's saying in this passage here is that Christ coming in the flesh through the nation of Israel was the greatest overall promise that God made. Um, I mean, the promise, the, the, the service of God, the giving of the law, the covenants, the glory, the adoption, all of that's important. But keep in mind, all of that was given to point to Jesus Christ because He is overall. So I believe that the greatest thing God ever did through the nation of Israel is to bring Jesus Christ into the world. And I'm so thankful that He did. And I also want to go so far as to say this, that He did that all thanks to God and no thanks to Israel. <laughs> I know that sounds like a rough statement, but if Israel could have messed it up on several occasions, they would have. I'm thankful for every time I'm reading in the Bible and I read where Israel followed God and did what was right and, and observed God's laws and statutes. And boy, how God blessed them for that when it was going on. But let me just tell you, you got to look through the weed pile to find those times. Because most of the time, that was not what they did. Most of the time, they were going their own way. Now, here's what I want to say about... Uh, Paul addressing the nation of Israel, the Israelites, in Romans chapter 9. I want to remind you of something. This is not the only time in the book of Romans that he has addressed the nation of Israel and the condition of the nation of Israel. I'm going to take you back to Romans chapter 2 for just a moment. Look back with me to Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 1... Paul has fixed the godless Gentile population under the condemnation of God for their sin and their waywardness, their, their reprobate nature against God. But in chapter 2, he addresses a different crowd. He addresses a different audience. He says in verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Now, right here, starting in chapter 2, he's talking to the religious Jews. He is speaking directly to the Jewish people who were very judgy. <laughs> That's exactly right. They, they looked at the Gentile people and they had a lot of judgment toward the defilements of the Gentile people. But in reality, Paul said, that the nation of Israel had no room to judge uh, the, the uh, Gentile unbelievers because they did the very same things that they judged the Gentiles for. 
And if you look back in Jewish history, if you look back in the Old Testament, you will often find the Jews living in the exact same ways that the Gentiles did, and sometimes right in the chambers of the temple of God. They were doing the same kind of wicked uh, 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 worship of false gods and idolatry and all kinds of horrible sinful practices and, and, all, and all this kind of stuff. Um, Jesus dealt with this, by the way, um, when he dealt with the Pharisees, pointing to their sins, pointing to their hypocrisies. And yet the Pharisees were those who judged other people in matters of, of uh, living and religious uh, nature. And yet they did many of the things they, that they accused others of doing. It's just a mess. So he goes on to say um, about the Jewish people, he says in verse number uh, 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Um, he's saying to the Jewish people, Yes, God's been good to you, but he's been good to you to lead you to change your mind about your sin. The goodness of God has been shown to you to lead you to repentance. Verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, they, they will receive, he's saying, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Verse 11, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Then in parentheses, he takes a few verses to say that nobody has really been without the law completely because even the Gentiles that were never exposed to the commandments of God had the law of God written in their hearts all that time. Verse number 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou, art, that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, uh, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Chapter 3, verse 1. 
What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. He Paul's right here and say, if the Jews had any advantage at all, and they did, it was this, that God chose to reveal himself through them as a people. They had the revelation of God. That's a big deal. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous, who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have uh, before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. I want to point this out to you. That all the world may become guilty before God. Verse number 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncir- and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Now, I don't know if that's interesting reading to you, but let me tell you, that reading has a lot of effect on how we interpret Romans chapter 9. Because... When he comes back to Romans chapter 9, and he is now talking about the Israelites again, and how the nation of Israel... I've said this before, I want to remind us again. This chapter is about the nation of Israel, and how they fit in the plan of God. How they fit in the workings of God, and God's sovereign plans. So in Romans chapter 9, when it comes back talking about Israelites... And how they fit into the plan of God. 
we can kind of get some perspective from Romans 2 and 3, some of the struggles that the Jewish people were having in their thinking. Because it was very common for a Jew to think of themselves as a child of God already because they were a child of Abraham. It was very common for them to think, I already have special favor with God and I already receive mercy from God because of my birth and because I've done the law. But in the first, in, in, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Romans, if you didn't read it, I want you to go back and read it for yourself again. Paul crushed all of those arguments. He destroyed them. I mean, he smashed them into smithereens. He said, look, there is nothing special about you over the Gentiles in the eyes of God because God is not a respecter of persons. You do have an advantage in every way, chiefly that it was given unto you the oracles of God. God gave you His revelation. But here's also what we understand from what the Bible teaches about that too. Where God gave more revelation, God gave more accountability. So there's more that Israel has to answer for because of their relationship with God as a nation than the Gentile nations round about them. But the Gentile nations round about them have just as much right to a relationship with God as the nation of Israel does. <laughs> so here's where we get into chapter 9. And I'm, I'm smiling, I'm grinning like a Cheshire cat because I get excited about this. So God sees mankind, and this is very clear from chapters 2 and 3. Here's what God sees across the board. You ready for this? He sees sinners. He sees marred clay. I love that song that says he didn't throw the clay away. He could have, but he didn't. That's how much he loved us. But he, he looks at mankind and across the board, men, women, boys, girls, they're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. And so God's plan for all of mankind being sinners was to provide His Son in the flesh to take their punishment for sin and then turn and offer them eternal life through His life. So that now anyone in Christ can be forgiven of sin, clothed in His righteousness, and reconciled to a holy God. Somebody please say amen. I'm, I'm so glad of that. And God's plan for doing that, make no mistake about it, was a sovereign plan. Let me talk about that for a second. It means nobody can mess this up. Nobody can stop this from happening. Nobody can interfere with this. Man has decisions to make. But not one decision of man will thwart the plan of God to bring a Savior into the world. Now I just want to say, I thank God that He's a sovereign God. I thank God that man's free will choices, and we have them and we make them. But I'm thankful that man's free will choices do not stand in the way of God's sovereign purposes. Because He is sovereign. What that means is exactly what the Bible says. His ways are higher than our ways. His means are higher than our means. His abilities are higher than our abilities. You say, well, I don't quite fully wrap my brain around the sovereignty of God. Well, I'd say if you could wrap your brain around the sovereignty of God, you'd be sovereign like God. But you're not. So of a truth, His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And man makes his decisions, but the decisions man makes don't stop God from fulfilling His sovereign purposes, and I for one am very, very glad. 
So God has a plan for bringing a Savior into the world in the flesh. You know what that means? <laughs> that if he's going to, if he's going to, if God's going to become a man and come into the world, like God said in Genesis 3.15 as the seed of a woman, then the woman he's going to come through is going to be a sinful woman. Well, you're really offending the Catholics here. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm trying to preach the truth. Mary was a sinful woman. Mary was a sinner. Born of a sinner. Who was born of a sinner. And going all the way back. Everybody with me here? Look, Mary can't intercede to God on your behalf. Mary needed an intercessor just like I did. Just like you did. Because Mary was a sinner. And then you go back to Mary's daddy and he was a sinner. And Mary's granddaddy was a sinner. I can keep going if you want me to, but I think you get the picture. They're all sinners. Well, watch this. So God has this sovereign purpose to accomplish of bringing Christ into the world in the flesh, but all He has to work with are sinners. I believe the phrase that I reread a moment ago from Romans 2 and 3 was this. Guilty before God. All of them. Any person God was going to use was a guilty sinner. <laughs> so if God's going to accomplish His sovereign purposes, He's going to have to use some sinners in a way that they don't deserve. He's going to have to bless and elevate and exalt some sinners beyond what they deserve because we're all guilty before God. So Romans 9 is telling us that to accomplish His purpose of bringing Christ into the world, God is going to have to show mercy to some while showing judgment to others. That's just a fact. And watch this. Because He's God, He gets to do that. Now listen to me very carefully here because I don't, I don't want anybody's mind running off down a rabbit trail here because a lot of people have ran down this rabbit trail and then they've got stuck and hurt and then hurt other people. The mercy that I'm talking about God extending here was God showing mercy to sinners for the purpose of accomplishing His sovereign purpose of bringing a Savior into the world for all mankind so that all mankind might have a place where they can find guaranteed mercy. That's important because this mercy that God's showing here is not God being merciful to save some from their sins and judge others for their sins. As a matter of fact, there might well have been those in the line of Christ that God chose, that He elected, and that He was merciful to to accomplish His purpose who died and went to hell. Because the election that is being talked about in Romans chapter 9 is not an election to reconciliation with God. It's an election to accomplish His sovereign purposes. And He chose some Jews for this purpose, but He also chose some Gentiles for this purpose. Don't look now, but in the line of Christ, there's several Gentiles that show up. <laughs> well, how'd they get in there? Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here. The sovereign purpose of God? His election? But let me just tell you, their salvation, because Romans 2 and 3 made this clear too, their salvation had nothing to do with whether God chose them to be in the line of Jesus Christ or not. Their salvation had to do with when they were faced with the truth of who God was, were they going to repent of their sins and believe in God and His promises or reject? That's where their salvation was. That's where their salvation was. 
But, but in, the, in the accomplishment of his sovereign purposes, he as a sovereign God could choose to show mercy to whom he would show mercy and he could choose to show judgment to whoever he was going to show judgment. Now, I'm going to use my words here and then we're going to go read the passage. But that might cause some in our logic and our thinking to look at those situations and say something like this. You ready for this? Well, that's not fair. That God would show His mercy to them, but God would show mercy to them, that's not fair. Paul, Paul even said there would be some that would cry about that. But let me point out this truth. Anyone that God used in relationship with God were all on the same baseline. Sinners. And sin has always deserved judgment. So watch this. There is no unrighteousness with God. There's nothing unjust with God. God never punished a sin that wasn't committed. God never punished a sinner that that God never punished a sinner that was uh, not guilty. God only doles out judgment and punishment to those who deserve it except for one time. And that was when he poured out his judgment for all sin, for all men, for all time on his son, Jesus Christ, who deserved none of that. We did. So that dying for our sin, being buried and raising from the dead, He might grant mercy to all who called upon Him by faith. That, that's just Bible truth. Watch what He says here in Romans chapter 9. He says in verse number... Let me sum, let me sum up real quick the verses that we've already dealt with. God did not choose the line of Christ that He chose based solely on birth or behavior. He, he didn't choose people that were good people because they were good people. He didn't choose people because they were promised seeds. No, he, he had sovereign choices that he made along the way. And then we come down to this. He says in verse number 15, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Let's not be confused tonight about what it is. I'm talking about verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth. It is not salvation, it is the sovereign purposes of God being accomplished. Verse 17, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm not going to spend near the amount of time preaching on this that I have done in study on this. But let me just speak real quick to the fact that whom he will, he hardeneth. When you go back and you read Exodus chapter 6, verses uh, through uh, uh, Exodus chapter 6 through Exodus chapter 10, you'll read the story of Moses going to Pharaoh, saying, let my people go. God had told Moses, before he ever walked into Pharaoh, that Pharaoh would refuse, and that he would harden his heart. 
As you read out the next several chapters, you will see three different statements that repeat themselves. And in their context, they all seem to be used interchangeably. One is this, that Pharaoh, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. That his heart was hardened. It doesn't necessarily say who's responsible, but that his heart was hardened. And that the Lord hardened his heart. So we have all three. So, preacher, who's hardening Pharaoh's heart? Uh, yes. I know you hate it when I give that answer to questions. But the Bible says that both Pharaoh hardened his heart and that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, how can that be? Well, one of the questions that's about to be asked here is uh, a sympathetic question toward Pharaoh that why would God chose Pharaoh if God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Like God had sole responsibility in that. Well, according to Exodus, God did not bear sole responsibility in hardening Pharaoh's heart. As a matter of fact, every time, every time God gave Pharaoh the opportunity to acknowledge him and do the right thing, the Bible says that Pharaoh refused. Let me ask you something. Whose choice was that? Now, there's some that would say, well, that was God's choice. God made Pharaoh choose. God doesn't do that. That's not the character of God. That's not how God works. And yet, we can also understand this. Read the account and you can see this. That Pharaoh's heart became increasingly harder. With every decision that Pharaoh made, his heart became harder and harder and harder. Well, who was hardening Pharaoh's heart? Well, it could be said that Pharaoh was responsible for hardening his heart. And it could also be said that God was responsible for hardening Pharaoh's heart. That does not mean that God was sovereignly choosing for Pharaoh. But it could be like this. And I'm going to say it could be because I've probably still got some more study to do. If God lets me pastor another 30 years, then maybe I'll have time to look at it some more. But this, this, is what, this is what I've studied. I'm just going to give this to you. You do with it what you will. But I know this. As a parent, I have been responsible for hardening my children's heart at times. Not that I made a hardened choice for them, but here's how it happened. Something had been presented to them that they hardened at that they bristled at. And as a parent, I couldn't just let that go. So I had to bring them to a point of decision over that again. So it could be said that by bringing them to yet another decision about that truth or instruction that I had given them, that I bore some responsibility if they chose to harden again to that, that I bore some of the responsibility of that hardness. Because I could have just left it alone, but I didn't. I brought it up again. So if they bristled again, part of that's on me. But it's a necessary thing. Because part of my responsibility as a parent is to confront those that are under my authority with truth. And I'm hopeful that they respond in a correct manner and in a right manner. Listen, I can show you from Romans chapter 9 that God was hopeful of Pharaoh making the right decision and doing something in the right manner. Well, where does Romans 9 ever said that? Well, it says this, that he was willing to show his wrath, but in his willingness to show his wrath, he endured with much long suffering. If God, if God is making the decision for Pharaoh to reject him, that's not long-suffering. That's not enduring anything from Pharaoh. That's not it at all. No, by the fact that the Bible says that God had long-suffering in this matter, it's that God treated Pharaoh with tolerance in a hope that Pharaoh would make the right decision. I want to point out to you 
that it also reveals that the sovereign purpose that God exalted Pharaoh for was to make his name great. Don't you think that Pharaoh had more than one option into how that was going to happen? Pharaoh was in a strong position to bring glory to God's name. And he could have done it by saying, I'm the leader of the largest empire in the world, and I want it known that the God of Israel is the God. And what he says goes. And we repent of all of the worship of our false gods, and we also want to follow the God of Israel. You say, well, he couldn't do that because God wouldn't let him. That is not in accordance with the Word of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, even Pharaoh. Even Pharaoh. So Pharaoh had choices to make. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And when Pharaoh would harden his heart, God wasn't willing to just let the matter go, and God would bring who he was and his power and his greatness back before Pharaoh again. And Pharaoh would crumple slightly and he would say, I have sinned. Moses, would you please pray to God for me that he would take this plague away. And God, by his grace and by his mercy, would relieve that. And as soon as the Bible says, as soon as Pharaoh would see that there was respite, he would harden his heart again. And say, well, I guess that wasn't that bad. He's making some decisions here. But guess what? (laughs) Pharaoh's decisions were not able to interfere with God's sovereign purpose. If God wanted His people back in Israel to fulfill His promises, His people were going back to Israel. There was a time in in that judgment of the plagues that even Pharaoh's advisors came to him and said, Pharaoh, how do we get rid of this man? Because he has been such a snare to us. Then they said this, Pharaoh, can you see not that Egypt is destroyed? Even his advisors were coming to Pharaoh saying, Pharaoh, this is no time for pride, man. This is no time for ego. This is a battle that you're not winning. You're losing this thing. Let's get rid of this guy. If he wants his people to go, let him go. Pharaoh's making some decisions. But I'm going to tell you right now, no no decision that Pharaoh made was able to thwart the sovereign purpose of God. How do you know that? Well, Jesus Christ was still born in Bethlehem, wasn't he? Well, why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Well, that's because uh, there, were, there were the children of Israel living in the promised land. Well, how'd they get there? Well, they left Egypt. Well, how'd they leave Egypt? Well, because eventually Pharaoh said, okay, go. And then even when he changed his mind again, God said, no, nope, they're, they're too far out now. I'm going to put the Red Sea between them and you. And even though he pursued, it didn't work. Why? Because God's sovereign. He says in verse number 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Watch this. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Look, God didn't make anybody a sinner. (laughs) Even though God has sovereign plans in the lives of human beings, and even though God will use sinners to accomplish His purposes, this is not talking about salvation. God didn't make anybody a sinner. Verse 21 Hath not the potter power over the clay? I think this is an important statement right here. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. He's saying right here, look, take for example Pharaoh. Pharaoh is one lump of clay. God can make him a vessel unto honor or God can make him a vessel of wrath. 
God can, God can pour out His judgment. God can grant mercy. Watch what He says in verse 22. What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, Verse 25, as he saith also in O.C. What in the world is O.C.? That's Hosea. That's the Greek transliteration of, of Hosea. I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. When you go into chapter 10... Paul follows that up by saying, Brethren, my, my prayer to God and my heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. So he says, Preacher, what is Romans 9 about? It's about this. Just because you're part of the nation of Israel doesn't mean you have a relationship with God. Just because in your heritage and history, your people have received mercy to accomplish the purposes of God and other Gentiles have received the wrath of God doesn't mean you have any special favor with God. There is only one way to know the sure and tender mercies of God and that is through the sovereign plan of salvation that God worked by His mercy, by His grace, through the nation of Israel and that is the person of Jesus Christ. If any individual Jew today is going to be saved, they've got to do it by faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. If any Gentile is going to be saved today, they've got to do it by faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Well, is there any, is there any blessing of being a Jew? Well, you've got a good heritage. Your father's received revelation from God. That's pretty neat. But does it make you closer to God? Not at all. Can you, can you look up into heaven one day and say, but I'm a child of Abraham? <laughs> nope. There's only one way. The Bible says there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, but I look over the Old Testament and we received mercy when Gentile nations didn't. You know what Romans 9 is saying? Paul says, yeah, you know why? Because God was using you to accomplish sovereign purpose. That didn't save you. That mercy God showed you did not put you in relationship with Him. If you didn't believe the promise of God, you didn't have a relationship with God. Yeah, you can look back and say, I've seen mercy. I've seen grace. But without Jesus, you don't know God. Well, let's just talk to us here for a second. It's interesting. I knew the devil wouldn't like this part of the message. Because I'm going to talk to us. Titus 2.11. I know I quote this all the time. But the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. You know what? 
you should be able to look back over times in your life and see where God's been gracious to you. I'm talking about if you're sitting here tonight and you've never called upon Jesus as your Savior, you could probably look back and see where God's been merciful to you. Where God hasn't given you everything you deserve. Where God hasn't judged you for your sin like you deserve His judgment. But i got to tell you something. You can't stand before God and say, but God, there were times that you showed me grace. But God, there were times that you showed me mercy. But there were times, God, where it seemed like you, get, you let me get away with that. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. Just because God's been gracious to you, understand why He's been gracious to you. He's been gracious to you to bring you to salvation. Amen. He's been good to you to lead you to repentance. But without repentance and faith, don't count on that grace and mercy to be extended beyond this life. Because the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says there is only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus Christ. Only by faith in Him can that matter be resolved. I'm thankful God's been good to you. Has it led you to repentance? I'm glad that God's been gracious and merciful to you. But has it led you to want more of that mercy? And to know that your sin is forgiven? Because that's what He offers through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight.